Welcome back to Role Models with me, Rich Crowley. Today's guest is Christine Bradstreet. And Christine is actually the first editor that ever published a piece of my work. So I am deeply grateful for that. She's an editor of Change Your Mind, Change Your Life. She's a top writer on and off medium. And she's someone that is so deeply committed to chronicling her own personal evolution and writing from this experience so others can relate to it and use it as bits of education that they can apply to their life, which we get into, you know, conversations about applying the golden rule backwards, confronting fear. It's a very, you know, personal self-growth type conversation. If we're going to talk about changing your life, how can we not talk about meditation? Meditation is the practice I often credit for changing my life and making it a commitment and, and opting me into that change every single day. Half Moon Yoga meditation is a great reminder for that for me. I have a couple of their cushions that sit right behind me at the bottom of my bed and I practice every morning. I try to every afternoon and for them to believe in what this show is, it's such a great synergy and I'm so grateful for them. Also, golden root turmeric latte mixes. Have you heard the news recently? Everyone is touting this magic ingredient, curcumin, and the properties that it has. Curcumin is in turmeric. Turmeric latte mixes have curcumin. It's a very transitive understanding. So yes, drink these because they're healthy, but also drink them because they're delicious. And what golden root is working on is a sugar-free, caffeine-free health beverage, health lecture. Um, I'm so grateful that they're part of the show as well. Thank you for coming back for another episode. And now let's go chat with Christy. Welcome. Hi, Hi thank, you. thank you for having me here. This is exciting. Thank you for joining. And did I miss anything? Your your resume is pages long <laughs> and doing prep on you is reading a lot and it was really exciting, but did I miss anything? Uh, I don't think you missed anything. I, I do work as a life coach today, okay. kind of putting all of that experience and all those uh, skills together to help people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but you you got it all. Thank you. And what a wonderful portfolio of work to share to clients or prospective clients where you can say, I have this years long catalog, this library of all of your work that I've had the luxury. Um, I feel fortunate to have been able to have read that over the past couple of days and even before when I first discovered you. But um, we'll we'll get into all of that. The The first question I wanted to start this conversation was, to bring it back and understand your writing history. So I know you've been on Medium for just over two years. You have your blog at um, christinebradstreet.com. When did you start writing? What has been your, your writing history? Yeah. You know, I didn't call or consider it blogging, but years ago when I was practicing as a chiropractor, I used to send out a Monday email that I called it Monday Motivation. And it had a paragraph or two about an uplifting message to help people with mindset, excuse me, mindset, you know, on top of their typical chiropractic care. And that was more popular than I expected. And a few people said, oh, you know, Christine, you should write a book. And I instantly dismissed that as a task that just sounded impossible. Uh, but then, you know, a little over two years ago, I started writing on Medium. And, uh, you know, I don't know, I think I've written close to 300 Medium posts at this point. And it just took off. And now I consider myself a writer on, mm -hmm. on top of anything else. Has writing 300 plus blog posts, has it gotten <laughs> easier? You know, when you sit down at the keyboard and have an idea, yeah. is it quicker? Are you faster at it or do you still have the same process? You know, most times it's the same process. Uh, there's sometimes an idea that's just so inspired internally that just flows. And then there's other times, you know, you can spend an entire day on, on one post. I think you probably understand the feeling. Um, but the 
the skills, because, you know, writing is an art, and then there's like a technical side of it, mm -hmm. too, and the technical side of understanding my formatting and choosing photos and getting it up online and editing, that that definitely goes faster. Yeah, and those are, I mean, those, those are key parts of it, that mm -hmm. as much as we want to classify ourselves as artists of our medium being the, the written word, there's still a lot of... Um, other things that we have to do, like you said, adding the photos, yeah. adding certain texts and quotes, italics, publishing it, distributing it. We'll get into all of that. But you, you also mentioned something saying, I now lead with that I'm a writer. Yeah. What was the process of you gaining the confidence to start introducing yourself and say, I am a writer? Yeah, I'm a writer, and and you're you're shaking hands, giving hugs. People are asking what you do. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm a writer. Now, yeah. arriving at that point, what did it take to get there for you? You know, it's funny you ask because that wasn't easy initially for me. Uh, there was a little bit of hold, a sense of holding back because I hadn't published a book yet, mm -hmm. um, and people knew me as these other things. They knew me as a chiropractor, as a mom, as um, I had delved into some other things like photography and business coaching. And so I had to set that fear aside. And the very first time I said it, it was a little bit of like, I'm a writer, <laughs> it came out. But then once I did it the first time, that was it. It just took saying it once. And, you know, any any doubts or insecurities we have about titles, they just come from inside of us. You know, I don't know if I was worried about other people, what they would think, but that was not necessary. I share that. I know we're often, the follow-up question is usually, oh, where do you write and what do you write? <laughs> and in the first couple of times that I introduced myself as a writer, I then had a follow-up insecurity because I was like, oh, I don't have a big logo. I don't have yeah. a book. Mm -hmm. I just have my newsletter and I have my 60 some odd blogs and articles, but I'm proud of them. Yeah. And it, you feel like you have to defend the d decisions you've made. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, like you said, it's just a fear that once you overcome yourself, it, mm -hmm. it has that muscle where you're so much more confident in saying you are a writer. Yeah. With, with your writing, what are some of the markers or signals that make it a Christine Bradstreet piece? You know, I was just going through applications from writers that want to submit to the publication that I run over at Medium. And I'm going to, it's going to be a paraphrase. I don't have it memorized, but somebody, one of the application applicants said that different from typical motivational pieces that the pieces over at change your mind change your life are softer and more caring and loving and that really summed up you know another writer summed that up so well for me i want my pieces to inspire and they definitely would fall under the category of self-help or mm -hmm. self-improvement or personal development but i want them all to be with the flavor of you know, love yourself and accept yourself right now. You you are okay. Like, even though we all still want to grow and advance and expand and, you know, for lack of better words, become better people, you are okay. You know, you're okay. Love yourself, accept yourself right now. And so that's really the theme that I want to show through everything that I write and publish. I had a note that going through your work, two things came to mind. One was this vulnerability that you share in your mm -hmm. writing and it, it makes them very relatable that mm -hmm. as a peer someone could be reading that and say oh I've, I, I know I know that exact feeling yeah. and to build on that you have several pieces that articulate how we are hardwired as humans that mm -hmm. fear is actually something inside of us that has protected us yeah. But you know, evolved. I was like, how do you confront your fear? And that was in, you had a piece called It's Okay to Be Afraid, yeah. where you, you spoke about confronting this fear. And I really appreciated that. So if I can add, I would definitely say you have that vulnerability aspect and this, this knowledge and understanding of how we are hardwired as humans. Yeah. Early, thank you. Yeah, of course. 
earlier we we spoke about what else you have what else goes into being a writer how it's not just hitting the mm -hmm. keyboard I can publish it sometimes adding it to a publication it's emailing it out and managing a newsletter I love this conversation asking writers what's in your distribution strategy mm -hmm. and yeah oh, sorry. No, uh, I'm careful to go through the same steps. So I've laid out a system so that I can feel assured that I didn't skip any of the steps. And mm -hmm. so every time I publish a piece, I cross post at my own blog. Well, I publish first on Medium and then I cross mm -hmm. post on my own blog, the ChristineBradstreet.com. And I cross post as a um, in the community section of Thrive Global. And so pieces will go on those three set those three platforms and then i use hootsuite to help me distribute to my social media so i have a facebook page my own uh, facebook page christine bradstreet uh, linkedin and twitter so i'll use hootsuite to broadcast them across those platforms and then i'll share it on my personal private facebook page and try to get a little dialogue going about the piece you know maybe give a quote from it or ask a question was there ever a hesitation to sharing your work? Um, there, I didn't feel hesitant. I really didn't. Um, yeah, so we talked about me hesitating a little to call myself a writer at the beginning, but I've always felt comfortable sharing my work and with the goal being that it's spreading love and, and helping people feel better about themselves that I felt confident that it would be real, well received. Mm -hmm. The goal of writing, and you just reiterated there that it's helping individuals and spreading love. Mm -hmm. A conversation I have often with writers is this this writer's, this un, unspoken writer's integrity where, hey, write for yourself. It's mm -hmm. not about earning income. Mm -hmm. Yet, when we call ourselves writers and professional writers, right. baked into that is, hey, there yeah. needs to be some sort of minimum income so where do you land on the conversation of is it okay for a writer to say yes i want to earn money with my writing oh yeah absolutely i mean that's your trade that's your profession and you are giving out to the universe and so it's natural that the cycle flow and that you know something presumably money flows back to you in return I think it becomes evident to a reader when you are writing with the motivation only to increase your revenue, like, you know, putting in too many affiliate links or being mm -hmm. a really strong sales pitch over and over again. Um, but certainly I feel like it should be expected and natural to have compensation for the work that you put out. One thing too is, you know, Medium, a platform that we have met, and both write on has allowed mm -hmm. us to say, hey, you're joining someone else's platform and they're gonna compensate us where it's not texting a friend and saying, hey, give me $3 to read mm -hmm. this. So it's yeah. allowed this, this little bit of barrier to, to increase comfort, but I'm with you on that. I, I really, you know, I do want to be rewarded for my work, but also mm -hmm. want to make sure that that's not the driver when yeah. I'm writing, it's not, let me turn this article out because there's a fixed dollar amount that I know comes back to it. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of writers do share that, but hearing others <laughs> speak that out and mm -hmm. say it out loud, it's, it, it gives us all permission to say, hey, it's, it's okay. I wanna ask you first about a concept. You have a piece called pay it backwards. And it's this idea that make a choice to treat someone how you wish you were treated in the past. It's applying a golden rule backwards. And in this piece, there was a lot of personal experience that you included, which as a reader, I'm grateful mm -hmm. for. But I'd love to hear from you an expansion on this concept of paying something backwards. Yeah. Forward. Yeah, uh, this concept came to me on a like an inspiration because we've all heard of paying it forward, you know, doing some usually small but nice thing like buy a coffee or pay a toll for the person behind you that you don't even know who they are. Um, but it got me thinking, um, pay it backwards 
more from the concept of treat somebody the way you wish you had been treated in your past. Mm -hmm. and, and my personal experience with it was, I have a close friend who was going through a bit of an upheaval in her family. They were taking in four foster children and I wanted to make them meals to help take you know some load off of my friend's uh, plate. And this little grumbly feeling popped up in me like, oh man, for years I was a single mother and I was running my practice and I was going nonstop and how much it would have meant to me if somebody would have made me a meal, but that never happened. And I was kind of feeling sorry for myself. <laughs> and then, you know, it just dawned on me, that's, that's how I know I need to do this for my friend. Like it's what I wish had happened in my past. It didn't happen, but that's not going to stop me from doing it for somebody else. I, I didn't want to be ruled by any resentment or uh, grumbly feelings like that. It's, it's such a selfless concept to have the ability to say, just because I wasn't treated at this premier level of how I think yeah. we should, doesn't mean I'm going to pass that on. It's like, I'm going to make sure that I'm the dead end street for yeah. that. And now we're going to have this new way forward. Yeah. In, in the next step will always reveal itself. This is a blog you wrote. Mm -hmm. You wrote that the answer is always simple. Yeah. And that was a theme with a lot of your writing. It's like trusting instinct and it's your gut. What is it that you've been able to cultivate that allows you to say, hey, like the answers are usually often quite simple? Yeah, you know, it's our human mind or ego that wants to complicate things or thinks that bigger is better or it has to cost a lot of money or take, a, you know, skills we don't have. But I've always found that the answer that my intuition, that, that small voice inside, that gut feeling is usually very simple and not complicated, or at least intuition's willing to deliver it one step at a time. So I really only need to know the next step. I don't need to know the next 50 steps today. I just need to know the next one. And that's challenging because, you know, of course, I also have a human mind that wants to know it all right now and, and I won't expect that things need to be complicated. So I just need to remind myself, nope, I, I know what the next step is and only focus on that for right now. And when it's time, the next step after that will be revealed. Is that a is that an exercise that you constantly put yourself through? Just having uh, having this patience to recognize when you want to jump ahead and being able to pull back. Yeah, you know, to develop an awareness about it without jumping in the role, like being an outside observer that just says, oh, Christine, you you know, your brain's racing to the future too far again. Come on back and <laughs> just remember what the step is. Um, so it, it took a little time to develop that awareness, to observe it, and then just remark like, oh, it's happening again to kind of bring me back. Now... 300 plus pieces on Medium. It'd be hard to ask you if you have a single favorite one, but I will ask, is there a favorite type of blog that you really enjoy writing? Yeah. Well, I was giving some thought to this and one stood out as very, that I felt really good about writing. And when I published it, I remember even thinking this might not be good from a business standpoint, because it was quite vulnerable and honest. Um, but I do have diagnosed ADD and I had tried to self manage it my entire life. And so I wrote quite a long piece about what it's like to self manage ADD your whole life. And it was very honest and parts of it were very painful. Um, it wasn't my best performing article, but it was a very good performing article. But aside from that, it just, felt so good to write it. And again, the vulnerability and the rawness, you know, just really hope that there's a lot of people out there with ADD. Could this possibly have helped them to be less stressed about it or maybe not beat themselves up about it and be more patient with themselves? I had a conversation with a musician uh, probably about two weeks ago now. And it was about this instant gratification and instant understanding if something performed well or not. 
Mm-hmm. And with things like that, 10 years from now, someone might read that piece yeah. and their life will change. And you may never know. Right. So I, I get sucked into this all the time where I'm like, it's time to release a new article. How are these performing? How are they not? But the one thing that's so true is when we do write those vulnerability pieces, yeah. someone along the line is going to read that and it's it's going to change their life and impact them because it's gonna it's gonna let them know you're not alone mm-hmm. and it puts someone else there they can check out more of you on your website it really humanizes a condition or an experience that they're going through mm-hmm. so I'm gonna make sure I link that that article along with the others in, in show notes here I I want to switch gears a little bit towards accessing your mind um, from from a new writer. And if you were a new writer right now, or a friend was, what types of tips would you share with them that you wish you didn't have to take two years or three years to discover that you wish you knew the first time you pressed the space bar? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things uh, falls in line with what we've already talked about, like be willing to be vulnerable, be willing to be honest. I don't think it's a good idea to to be shocking just for the sake of being shocking for without it being authentic. But don't be afraid to be honest, knowing there's going to be some people that don't agree with what you're saying, and and that's perfectly okay. But when you build an audience that's attracted to your honesty, your vulnerabilities, and they're a really loyal group of readers, and and that's what it's about. It's about building relationships like that. And then one thing that I did sort of at the beginning, and I'm really grateful I did, like, there's a ton of blog pieces, online courses, YouTube videos. Do some studying on how to be a good blogger or a good writer or a good um, publisher, self-publisher. The little details matter, like your title format, the, the flow, your font, your photos, and those things are important too, those technical aspects of it. I read every single one of those. I know better marketing uh, mm-hmm. releases them daily. And there's always the temptation to click on it. And I'm like, oh, am I getting sucked into a great headline? Right. But I really do think that to advance and to accelerate your career, you do need to study it and be a student. Mm-hmm. There'll be little nuggets that you might take out mm-hmm. and Spending five minutes on an article that might give you that tip is Mm -hmm. always going to be worth it. Outside of Google Docs and drafts and stories, are there other practices that you keep to either nourish or foster creativity and originality that allows you to be the writer you are? Well, this hits on the topic of a piece that I just started working on. When I feel stuck creatively, I get up and I move my body. So, you know, I can sit in front of the computer for hours trying to force something out and have it sound natural. I just find it so therapeutic to get up and move, do something completely unrelated to writing, whether it's, you know, 15 minutes on the yoga mat or a bicycle ride around my neighborhood raking leaves in the yard, you know, it could be anything. Just, you know, get up and move. And Do you that's find yourself, when you're moving, are you is your mind at ease or are you incubating the idea that you were stuck on? Yeah, you know, when I'm moving, I'm careful to turn my mind off. I'm not intentionally trying to think about it, but it almost always happens that yeah, you get inspirational ideas in the shower. It's sort of cliche. You know, when I turn my thinking mind off and I get moving my body or digging with my hands in the dirt, the answer just pops up. Mm -hmm. You have, you've built a loyal following. You've churned out 300 plus articles, all in addition to being the editor of a publication. And I want to switch gears and ask a very open question. Like, what is it like being an editor of a well-known, well-read publication. Oh, thank you. Uh, that has been very exciting. You know, and it's it's related to writing, but in a 
different skills, different way. And uh, the publication initially, I was only publishing my own articles on it. And then I decided uh, after several months of that, that I wanted to invite other writers to contribute. And today we have about 265 writers wow. and the publication is growing very rapidly. And it's at a point now to start thinking about what are the next phases for the publication? Um, Will it be time to bring in another editor to help me go through the submissions more thoroughly? Um, so those are, I'm, those are things I'm pondering about right now. And are you getting five, 10, 15? What's a daily submission list look like when you're, when you're plugging mm -hmm. in? Everything? Yeah, uh, it's been about 15 a day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, which wow. is thrilling, and and they're great writers, and and I'm just careful to make sure that everything falls within our our mission is short mm -hmm. and uplifting articles to help people you know live a healthier, happier life. Congratulations on that! I think you may have been the first editor to ever accept me into a publication <laughs> and publish one of my works. So I we have this historical gratitude um, and relationship with, with each other. Is there anything that as an editor you would love writers to know about what it's like being an editor? Yeah. And I ask it with an asterisk of the impatient writer who yeah. sends the email, hey, did you like it? Hey, did you get to it or not? Oh, now <laughs> Friday and they're thinking in their head, maybe they're not going to publish it. They would, they would tell me no if they didn't like it, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I want to be guilty of doing that. And it's a selfish question too. I want to know <laughs> what sure. else is like and any advice you might give to a writer. Well, uh, not only do I run a publication for a long time on Medium, I would publish my articles in other publications. So I definitely understand that, that angst or curiosity, like when's the piece gonna publish or I haven't heard from them, maybe they've rejected it and you don't know. I really was careful when I set up my publication to be as forthcoming with information as I possibly can. Um, everybody that submits an application to be a writer, when they come on board, they get a, an email, not only from Medium letting them know, but they get an email from me that spells out, you know, different requests and guidelines and whatnot mm -hmm. and, and welcomes them aboard. And then when, if I don't accept a piece, I'm careful to just to leave a private note on the piece so that the person can either publish it themselves or with a different publication. I'm very careful to answer emails when I get them. And, uh, but this is all why I'm starting to think about, you know, what's the publication gonna look like in six months? Because I do know that it would reach a point where it'd be difficult for me to have this much personalized attention uh, as it grows much bigger. And actually, not too long ago, I had a like a Zoom call with Nicole Akers from Publicious. Yeah, and, yeah, and uh, she was the first publication I was part of. So oh, the, the chain continues. Yeah. Um, and Agnes Louise, she uh, edits at three separate publications. So we we were kind of bouncing some ideas around about that. And that's a this is this part is new for me. Like running a publication, I didn't necessarily plan to do that. It happened and it's growing and I love it, but I've, I've got to do some thinking about how I continue to allow it to grow. Mm -hmm. And so six months from now, things could look much different for the publication. Also much different for you personally, because I know something will be public or live by then. <laughs> and I want to give you the opportunity to answer what is next? What's coming next for you? Thank you. Yeah, book is coming next, which is really exciting. That uh, is something new for me. And I do plan to have it published in about two months. And I'm working on its final edits right now. And then I will most likely be self-publishing it. That's the path I'm going down. Uh, but the book is called Happy Ever After. And it's about cultivating true and lasting happiness in your life uh, that can't be taken away regardless of what's going on. And right now there's a lot going on in our world, but we can remain happy through that. Is there a, a specific or target reader that you think this book would be a, you know, a must read This this has to show up on their doorstep? Um, who would, who would get along in this book? 
Yeah, target reader is somebody who just feels stuck. Like they know their life can flow with more, uh, with more ease and harmony, and they know that they weren't born to be grouchy or irritable or feel unsatisfied. So people who are looking to increase the amount of happiness in their lives. And the big focus of the book is healing the past, healing the baggage that's in your past, which really is just covering up the happiness that's inside of, of you. It is in there, uh, but thoughts and beliefs and baggage from our past can cover it up and make you not be able to feel it. I know, not even have, have read it yet, but having read your other work that I'll 100% give that an endorsement and say that if it's for someone who wants to be happy, it sounds like the target reader is just any of the 7 billion plus people on earth <laughs> because there, there's no cap on happiness and the happier an individual can be, they can begin to ripple it out. And mm -hmm. I think healing your past and healing past traumas, as I've matured and got older, I've been able to understand, you know, things are the way they are in my life or in my brain and in my relationships because of things that may have happened 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. So thank you for continuing to, to champion that narrative and, and educate people on that. I'm excited for that book to come out. So that'll be, you think, July? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Christine, I will... I hope that I'll be on your email list when, when you send it over to me. But for everyone else who wants to keep in touch with you, where can they find your work? Where can they follow you? Name every single place that we can uh, check you out. Yeah, you'll be able to see everything at my website, christinebradstreet.com. And I have a profile on Medium as well as the publication. And the publication is called Change Your Mind, Change Your Life. And in LinkedIn or Twitter, I, I don't remember my Twitter handle, <laughs> Christine Bradstreet at LinkedIn. I believe it's Christine underscore Bradstreet on Twitter. Amazing. And the book, again, it's Happy Ever After? Happy Ever After, yep. I'm going to keep my eyes up for that and hopefully the little inbox notification. But, Christine, I hope we, we can do this again when the book mm -hmm. comes out. And I just want to say a deep, deep, thank you and expression of gratitude for being my first publication, being my first editor on Medium, and now being one of the first guests on The Rough Draft. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Richie. Everything you do always impresses me. I'm really excited to see and continue to watch how you grow and what you, what you produce and put out there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.